I, I think to be to be a working cinematographer, you have to these days you have to be practical. Right. You know, you have to be responsible and practical and thoughtful, and you have to sort of, you know, the 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 cost of the day on a, on a major motion oh. picture is expensive. This episode is brought to you by the best-selling book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, How to Turn Your Independent Film into a Money-Making Business. Learn more at filmbizbook.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Eric Messerschmidt. Did I get it right, sir? You sure did. You nailed it. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Thanks so much for coming on the show, brother. Well, thanks so much for having me. Happy to so- be here. So you've uh, you've done a few things in the business uh, so far. You know, you're a young man, and you've you've been playing with some uh, some heavy hitters over over the course of your career. It's pretty interesting. <laughs> I've been really fortunate. Yeah, I've been I've been uh, I've been really fortunate to work with some great people for sure. Without question. So my first question is, man, how did you and why did you want to get into this insanity <laughs> that is the film business? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Um, I I was a kid that, that loved to make stuff. You know, I loved to take things apart. I loved to build things. I I, I was I was a terrible athlete, um, but I was creative and and I liked to take photographs and I liked to paint and, and I liked to play music and I was you know I was, I was always doing stuff and um, I I got involved in in theater really early when I was a kid and. Um, and I was I was never really interested in performing, but I was always interested in doing stuff behind the scenes. And that kind of led led me to um, a life in the movies, I think, you know, uh, to some degree. I, I, I like the, the camaraderie of it. I like the uh, um, the shared experience uh, of it. And, um, you know, when it came time to go to college and, and, and think about what I want to do with my life, it just, it just sort of seemed like a like a fit. And, and honestly, it wasn't so much about the work in the beginning. It was about the experience. You know, it was like about um, doing stuff with people, really. And, you know, sort of like, you know, photography in the beginning really interested me. But it's a it's a it's a it's a solo occupation for the most part. You know, I mean, in most cases, anyway, it's like it's, you know, it's just you and your camera, um, which I think can be really meditative, but, but, but it wasn't really what I wanted. I wanted, I wanted a, an experience with a team, you know, so that I just kind of landed in, in, in cinema, I guess, you know, went to film school and, and came out of it on the other end, uh, trying to figure out what to do for, you know, the next 40 years of my life or whatever <laughs> it ends up being. Now you came up in a time where you really needed to, kind of go through the mentoring process in, in, in the, in the scope of like, you've get on set, someone takes you under their wing and you might've learned some stuff in film school, but it really starts on the film set and you've kind of worked your way up and, you know, did a lot of gaffing work. You did second unit work until you became a cinematographer uh, on your own. Right. And so many filmmakers today, especially cinema, uh, young cinematographers today, they just come out and they're like, I'm a cinematographer uh, because I have a camera. And, and then I've worked with some of them and I go, Oh, you you've never seen Blade Runner? Oh, okay then. Uh, like it's 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 an interesting time because now you know when, when you and I were coming up because we're of similar vintage, um, a slightly bit older than you, but a little similar vintage. You know the, it was so expensive, man. Everything was so damn expensive. The gear was so expensive, and and you couldn't get access to this stuff, so you really couldn't practice on your. I mean, I'm assuming you came up on film as well. I did. I did. Yeah. I mean, I. My my generation of film students, you know, we didn't have HD cameras, or I don't I don't think you know when I was in school we even had a digital. I mean, it wasn't even part of the conversation. You know, we were processing sixty millimeter film, or you know the 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 senior students and the MFA students were shooting in thirty five, and you know it was like an investment to make a movie at that time. I mean, it still is obviously, but uh, but for us, you know, it was like you had two two cans, you know, two two 400 foot rolls of 60 millimeter and you had to make sure it counted, you know? Um, <laughs> oh, but every yeah, time that, th- I, you know, I no, every time you heard that little, like that's money, that's money just flowing. Now you yeah, just exactly. roll yeah. and roll and roll. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it was like back when rehearsal meant something, you know, I, you know, I, I think, um, I'm really glad I had that experience. And I'm glad I did it that mm-hmm. way. And, and, um, you know, I, uh, 
I, th I think it's important, you know, I mean, I, 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 no, I, I, I don't think that what we do or, or certainly what I do um, for a living can, can be learned in, in school. I mean, there's, you know, it's like you, you learn things like how to, you know, you kind of learn how to, how to react to imagery, I think, and how to critique imagery and how to think about movies and how to think about, you know, the big picture idea of storytelling and stuff to some degree in film school. And, um, you learn about your own taste and what you're attracted to and that kind of thing and how to communicate with other people. And, you know, all those are skills that are incredibly important. Um, but, but you don't learn much technique in film school, you know, because you just don't have enough time. You know, it's like, a, it's like the, uh, a film set is a complex environment, you know, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's an environment of, of technology and equipment and, and, and it's math and science. And it's also personality, you know, and storytelling and creativity. And it's, uh, it takes time, I think, to learn how all those things congeal, you know, and, and how to navigate it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I really believe that the kind of the mentorship idea or the, the idea of matriculating through the process is, is, is a really good one and something worth protecting. You know, I mean, I came out of film school and I was like, I'm a cinematographer, you know, I had business cards, I think. I said, I'm a cinematographer, well, I mean, you know, a business card. And that's all, that's all you need is a business card. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> fake it until you make it. Right. But, you know, I, and, and I, I got to LA and I, you know, I had shot some music videos and some short films and I was like, I'm going to be a DP and I'm going to do it. And then of course the reality of life hit me and I had to, <laughs> You know, my parents, you know, we, we didn't have any money. I didn't come from a wealthy family. My, you know, my parents are teachers and librarian. You know, it's like we, um, so I, you know, I kind of had to, I had to make it on my own to some degree, you know, and, and figure out how to make a living and pay my rent and all that stuff. Um, and, uh, and in the end, I wouldn't have, tra I wouldn't trade it for the world. You know, I mean, I, I got to meet so many great people and I, I learned from them, you know, you absorb their, their technique and their, their process. And I think that's crucial. It's certainly been incredibly important in my life. Yeah. You worked on, uh, as a, as you, you started really coming up as a gaffer and you did, a, you gaffed on a lot of big shows. I mean, you worked on Ant-Man. I know with Russell, Russell, okay. been in the sh with Russell, who's the sweetest human being mm -hmm. ever. Um, he's like lovely. Yeah, he's he is fantastic. such a lovely, soft-spoken guy. And I'm like, how did you work with James Cameron for so many years? Like, how <laughs> how did those two personalities work, man? And then he's like, I'll tell you some stuff off air. Uh, but uh, <laughs> 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 oh, I'm sure you've I'm sure you've heard a couple stories as, as well on set. Sure. But but sure. as a gap, so as a gaffer, can you explain to everybody what it meant to come up as a gaffer? Because the DPs I've worked with in my career who came up as gaffers, I find are so well versed on set. They just there's just a different way of looking at the set, how to do a setup. You've already been doing what you're telling somebody else to do because you're like, yeah, just set that over here. And then they just do their thing. How did yeah. that prepare you? How did that prepare you to be a DP? Well, you know, I think there's a couple things. And look, everyone's got their own process and everyone has their own, you know, their their own path. I, for me, um I was, you know, I was lucky. I, I, I liked lighting, you know, I liked the, I liked the stuff and initially I like, you know, I liked the process of being on a set and getting in the mix of it, you know? Um, but you know, when, when you're a gaffer, uh, you're in the movie quite early, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're in a lot of the, the early conversations, depending on how, how, uh, much the, the director of photography chooses to involve you. You're, you know, you're often on the early scouts. You're certainly on the tech scouts. You're in the production office. You're negotiating with the producers. You're negotiating for equipment and, re, you know, labor resources and stuff. And you're, you know, you're oftentimes in meetings with the director and trying to figure out how to accomplish certain things. And you're in a great position to observe those conversations happen as well as, you know, a bit of a fly on the wall in a way that, you know, camera operators and assistants are not, you know, you're, your camera operator, you're rarely on a tech scout. You're very rarely in the office in the prep. And, you know, you may have intimate conversations with a DP and the director about how they're going to approach certain things. But, but, but I think when you're a gaffer, you're really kind of in the thick of it. Um, and, and for that, you know, for me anyway, it was incredibly helpful to learn how to prep and how to, you know, learning how to read blueprints and draft and how to communicate with the art department. You know, you're, you know, as, when I was a gaffer, I spent a lot of time, um, 
in, in production designers offices and art directors offices and sitting in there with the draftsman, you know, you're low, you're, you, you know, you learn about all that stuff and you have to get good at it quickly if you're going to survive, you know? So, um, that, you know, that process and that, that kind of part of my life was, was incredibly helpful to me. Um, and then of course, you know, that's, doesn't even include all the conversations you have with the DP uh, in prep, right. but then also obviously during your, you know, during, during the shoot, you know, when you're shooting your, um, you know, at least when I'm a DP, my closest ally is always my gaffer, you know, I'm on, they're the person, you know, I, they're, you know, kind of the, the most effective weapon I have. And also, you know, the shoulder that I cry on in most cases, you know, <laughs> um, so, you know, because they, they're sort of, you know, the gaffer is, a, is in a really good position to kind of observe um, uh, objectively about what's going on in, in, on the set. You know, the operator is often in the mix. They're there with the, the actors. They're there with the director. They're, you know, they're, they're working every shot and they're, they're hyper involved. And the gaffer is, you know, working the setup and getting the setup right. And then they're in a position to kind of step back and watch the, the shot take shape and, um, so I, I find the gaffer is a really good person to kind of turn to for objection, fee, uh, objective feedback of what's going on and how the shot is taking shape and what they think could be improved and all that stuff. I mean, you know, not not always even just in lighting, just in terms of generally what we're doing, in, uh, you know, as filmmakers. And so, you know, right. I always when I look for a gaffer, you know, I, I look for a filmmaker first and foremost, you know, beyond um what their what their lighting scale might be or their personnel management skill is, you know. Now but, there's yeah, something I mean, I, I, I'm really glad I came up that way. You know? you know, no, no question, no question. And there's something that that they don't talk about very often, uh anywhere, let alone in film school, is the politics on set. Uh, there are politics that you have to deal with within the crew. There's different politic groups, there's the producers and the directors, but even just within the camera department. There's politics that, you know, and on set and on, you know, the production design. How do you approach dealing? Because I'm assuming it hasn't always been a smooth, smooth coast the entire career. You've had, you know, you've probably, you've probably run across some politics on set and how to deal with it and how to properly, you know, not step on people's toes and how to even fight for your own, you know, as a DP, even fight for your own uh, vision while still serving the director but there might be other departments that are pushing on you because it's easier for them, but might not serve this, the movie. There's all sorts of agendas on set that they just, people don't talk about. So can you kind of discuss that a little bit without obviously naming yeah. names? <laughs> sure. No, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, film set, film set is full of creative people. You know, people get in the movie business because they, they want to, they want to contribute, you know, and they, uh, they want to participate and, um, I, you know, I think, I think generally people in movies, sets and, and film crew, they, they have the best intentions, you know, um, uh, generally people, you know, they really want to make a great movie. Um, they want to, they want to do the work, they want to participate, but also, um, you know, a lot of the work is sometimes just service job, you know, move this from here to there do this, do that. And, and, and that can happen, um, you know, for someone in my position with a director, you know, if you're paired with a really strong director, Hey, I just need to put a 29 millimeter lens here. That's the shot. 29 millimeter lens here, you know, and you may personally think, God, it'd be so much better on a 35 and pull back a little bit, you know, but you have to be careful about, you know, when you, uh, assert yourself, you know, and, and you have to read the room and understand what's going on and sort of, you know, I, I, uh, it's it's you know i think it's about timing you know and 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 you're right it's it's there are people with agendas and there are people that desperately want to be heard and there are people who um uh who are uh who, who get frustrated when their voice is not heard you know and, <laughs> and and then sometimes you have to deal with that you know um and and it's you know it's that is part of the job for sure. You know, I mean, there's, there's a bit of air traffic control and personality management with being a director of photography, especially in a bigger movie, you know, where there's, um, oh. you, you know, you might have an operator who's very outspoken and wants to communicate straight with the director and you have to figure out how to, you know, when to assert yourself into that conversation, when to allow that conversation to happen, how involved you want to get, if, you know, decisions are being made that are outside of your, um, 
uh, what, you know, what you think might be appropriate for the scene, when to interject without making someone feel bad, et cetera. You know, it, it's, it can be complicated. Um, uh, you know, it, it happens with production designers too, you know, so how do you, uh, if you're a director of photography, how much ownership do you want to take over things like color palette, you know, or costume designers, production designers too, you know, you sort of have, um, you know, the director of photography, the production designer, and the costume designer are often tasked with sort of forming an aesthetic, the aesthetic principles of the movie, you know, you know, obviously with the help and, and with the leadership of the director, but you're, you're, um, you know, in, in many cases, you know, those three people, I think, um, end up sharing that responsibility. And, and to be honest with you, probably the director of photography gets a disproportionate amount of credit, which really should go, um, uh, in many cases, it should be more equally shared, I think. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging. And, you know, you, I think you hope that you, you end up with, uh, enough people who are generous and thoughtful and, and, and are able to share, um, themselves creatively, you know, that, that, that you don't run into a lot of problems. It's not to say that they don't exist. And, you know, I, I also think that there's something to be said for debate and, and disagreement, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, on, on a set, you know, it's like, some of the best work I've done has come because a production designer and I have disagreed about a direction to go on a particular set or a particular way to design something or, you know, especially like complicated physical effects, or, you know, sort of things like that that need that, you know, that are, that are different than a couple walls and a camera, you know, it's um, those oftentimes if, if, you know, two people meet and are strong minded and it's like, well, let's do this. No, I think we should do this. And then, you know, if it's a safe space creatively, then you work something out. If it's not a safe space, that's where it gets ugly, you know? <laughs> um, but I, I, I do think, you know, that's sort of the idea of it being a place for ideas that you can then, you know, um, debate is, is important. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your question? I mean, you're right. No, it answers. No, no, it, 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 you know, it's a, it's, it's a complicated thing. It's a very toe tub. You know, you, you're on eggshells kind of situation, and it is a case by case basis. Like as a cinematographer, you know, when you're working with a strong director, and you have worked and are currently working with two of the strongest directors in the business, Michael Mann and David Fincher, on your on on two of uh, two projects that are coming out next year. I mean, they're really strong directors fincher specifically you know i had i had your friend and colleague jeff uh, cronenworth on and you know i talked all about like david is legendary for being so technically precise with everything and he's he almost has a kubrick-esque vibe to him in the sense that he could maybe light the damn thing himself like Kubrick used to be able to do. Like he's yeah. so technically good sure. at this stuff. You know what I mean? So how do you as a cinematographer approach working with someone like David? Because I know you worked with Mindhunter, which by the way, gorgeous. Love that. Please tell me another season's Thank coming. Uh, <laughs> soon, please. I want another season. I think I'm not the only one. We all want another season. <laughs> I, yeah, me too. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. Yeah. Um, but like, how do you like? I, man, that was a different. That was a different scenario. I think that was kind of when you first started to work with David directly as a cinematographer. Correct. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. how did you? How I mean, did you, you know, approach David working with I, David? I, you know, I. I had seen Jeff work with David and I, you know, I mean, I have, Jeff is, a, is a, you know, an incredible mentor to me, you know, I mean, I owe him so much and, and, um, you know, Jeff is a real master at um, managing the set and managing the environment and, and supporting the director he's working with, you know, I mean, I've, I've worked with Jeff when I was a gaffer, I worked with Jeff on, with many other directors other than David as well, you know, and, and Jeff is always consistent at making, you know, he protects the director and, and um and supports them uh in you know whatever way he you know he can find that they need need support and i think that's something i learned from jeff is is you know the the, the role of the cinematographer is fluid um and it's it's not a binary black and white thing it's not like okay i do this and you do this it's it's um it's much broader than that uh and um you know i, th I think part of it is you 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 meet someone, you talk to them, and and then your you know, your first day on the set, you really learn what it is they need from you, or, right. or you know, and they don't always tell you, you know. I mean, I think is some you know directors, uh, 
you know, often think they need something other than what they what they actually need to, you know, I mean, they're, 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 they're not always the best people <laughs> at, at stepping back and observing what it is, um, um, how, how best they need to be supported, you know, I mean, I think none of us really are, you know, you sort of have to inquire and ask, ask, you know, what, <laughs> what happened there, you know, um, but, uh, you know, uh, David is not that case. David is extremely good at sort of recognizing where he needs help and what what he um, what he needs. And you know, David is an extraordinary communicator. He's very clear and concise, and you know, he has tremendous economy of language, so he can say quite clearly clearly about what he what he wants to accomplish. Um, but he's also, you know, he's he's been I, I think a bit mistreated because he is uh, incredibly collaborative. Um, at least mm -hmm. that's been my experience with him. Um, I heard the same thing. I you know, the very same. open to ideas and yeah, and um, and and excited about ideas and wants people to bring ideas to the table. He just wants them to. He wants the ideas to be presented in a in a reasonable way with enough time to to act on them. You know, um, and uh, helicopter shot but, right know, here. No, Let's I go. Mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, you know, no, it's like, and I I think that's. You know that's really what you want in a director is you want someone who has who who has a vision who has a plan who says okay we're going to do this and this and this and this um, and if there's room for improvement or room for other ideas you can voice them when it's appropriate and and they can you know it's 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 up to the director about whether or not they're going to take that idea or not you know I like, I don't think of my job as being one necessarily that um, that requires me taking ownership of anything I mean I think it's like you know I want um, a film I'm working on to be a dictatorship. I mean, I think that that's where the best work gets done. Honestly, it just should be a benevolent, benevolent one. <laughs> you know, it should be um, ideally. But uh, you, you know, it's it's. I I hope that I you know I, I come and approach something, and I and and the director I'm working with um, has brought me there because they they like or are interested in my point of view as well. You know, so so I yeah. you know I want to bring something to the party and. Um, and I think, you know, it's certainly my relationship with David has been that it's like, we, you know, we, we make a very good team in terms of evaluating what's going on on the set and, and, and bifurcating our collective responsibility. So even though, and you're absolutely right, David could for sure, um, uh, show up and, and talk directly to the gap and say, put that like there, put that like there to, you know, whatever, um, but he also knows that I have a skill and I have a, a communication method with the gaffer and I have taste and I have a, a point of view that, that, you know, for whatever reason um, he sometimes likes and is willing to, to let me run with. And then if he doesn't like something, he points it out and that's okay. You know, I mean, that's, I think that's part of the job and it's, it's really a, a lot of it is, is helping the director, you know, hold the walls up of their sandbox so that they can play, you know, and, right. and, I, and that's the way I try to look at it, you know, um, as much as I can. I mean, it's ego always gets in the way a little bit. You want you know, you really want to take, <laughs> uh, sometimes you feel strongly about whatever it is you're going to do. And, you know, I need to, you know, if, if you, you know, if it seems appropriate, you debate. And if it's, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but you know, you're not the director and that's how it is. And and I think you're right. I think when you said that David kind of gets a bad rap sometimes, I think it's because of the legendary number of takes he takes. And I think that kind of has been like the the mythology of of the myth of working with David. Like you're gonna do it's like Kubrick. Again, we'll go back to Kubrick. You're gonna do yeah. 70, you're gonna do 70 takes, and he might take take three, but he's gonna push you to 70 because that's just the way his process is. And and from someone who's worked with him. Is that true? He does do 60 takes of stuff. I'm not every take of everything. Obviously. I mean, he will. I mean, David, you know, David wants to do it until it's right. And I think he should, you know, I think absolutely should. I, I mean, and, and, you know, it's like, look, uh, I've been in a DI suite where we haven't done it right. And it's painful. Oh, it's I hard, know. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know? And, um, and, uh, you know, no, nobody walks out of the movie theater and says, at least they made their day. <laughs> um, That's so great. You, know? you should, you should actually get t-shirts made and give it to, <laughs> give it to the <laughs> department <laughs> and just like no one walks out of the theater and say, oh, they, at least they made their day. You're yeah. abs you're absolutely yeah. right. But that's, you but know, that's why, I, 
but that's why his that's why his movies look the way they look, and that's why they are the it's way true. they are. It's I mean, there's something really magical about a Fincher film, all the way back to you know from uh, Seven, even Alien Three, with all oh, the yeah. problems he had with that. But Seven and Fight Club and the game and and all of those films, they're so specific. Almost when I look at him, because I'm a huge David Fincher fan, he's almost surgical um, with how he approaches telling the story. It's almost like a surgical scalpel, almost like it's so clean and every edge is almost done right. And I think that just comes from. 10,000 commercials and music videos he shot before he ever got onto a film set for, yeah. for feature. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, look, it's like, I think I, what, what is important to appreciate about David and I think any, any filmmaker is that the, that, um, you know, David in particular though, is very aware of film technique and film grammar and the kind of, you know, the, 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 he's, he's incredibly cinema literate. So if you said to David, "Hey, I, I need you to go out and and um, we're, let's let's take this. You're going to take this commercial, but I need it done in the style of of, of Jean Luc Godard." You could absolutely do it. You know, it's like David's David's choice of technique is 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 his art. You know, uh, I think, and um, you know, I, I think I think people discount, and, and it's uh, and I wish it was taught more in, in cinema. Is the idea of this kind of balance between between intent and working practice? You know, the idea that you have you have you know the Kubrick methodology of like this is the shot I'm going to shoot, and it's going to be this shot. It's going to be on a 20, 27 millimeter lens, and the focus is going to be here, and I'm going to get it until it's perfect, right? And it might take all day, but I don't care because I need this shot. And then on the other side, you have the kind of French New Wave or Cassavetes or whatever you want to call it of this kind of verite idea of like, well, let's just go out and shoot, you know, um, um, Lars von Trier kind of thing. Like, let's just go out and shoot and be spontaneous and exciting and fun and we're going to get some stuff and then we'll figure it out in the editing room. And there's some intent in there. But, you know, they're both completely valid ways to make a movie. Mm -hmm. but, but both of them have a tremendous effect aesthetically on the movie. You know, and... And so it's, so you, your point is quite right. Like you don't get the David Fincher look <laughs> once you do it until it's perfect. Can you imagine you a know? John Cassavetti style David Fincher film? Can you imagine? Right, that, be amazing, right? that would be like just David but, with know, a camera. Go. <laughs> <laughs> like, can you imagine? <laughs> but you know, the other, the other side is true too. You know, if you, you, so it's, I think that, you know, you have to kind of, it, there isn't enough attention made towards the the environment of the set and the methodology through which you make the set has has a huge bearing on how the movie feels emotionally. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, we love to talk about shots and in film school, they look, you know, okay, let's do this handheld and it'll be exciting. Well, it's way more nuanced than that, you know, because um, you could do, you know, I mean, there's handheld shots and, and uh, you know, the great example, I, well, it's not handheld actually, but it's on the dolly, but, you know, the shot in Clute, where Jane mm -hmm. Fonda is walking through the, through the through the club and she's she's eyeing Roy Scheider and it looks spontaneous. You know, that shot looks like it's just a walk through the club, Jane, and we're gonna follow you. We're gonna pull back on the dolly. And it's like, no, it's been if you watch it a couple of times, you realize how incredibly rehearsed it is. Um you know, and 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 that's you know, I think that's the great example of like the perfect card trick of of, uh, of cinema is like making someone believe they've seen something spontaneous when in fact it's incredibly rehearsed, you know. And David is is you know better than anyone I know at at exactly that. Now, uh, is there is there any story that you can share publicly uh, <laughs> with the, of you and David working on set? Something fun, something. Like I learned something that day by seeing him work, something that you can share publicly. We could talk after our, after we hit the record button off. We could talk about the I, other ones. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, um, I think about that a little bit. I, yeah, probably. I mean, there's every day, you know, we're sort of confronted with, with stuff. I mean, it's like, right. you know, I mean. Uh, well, let me, let me ask you this. I, you know, you what sort was, of, I, 
Well, let me let me ask you this: What Go was ahead. the what was the worst day for you as a cinematographer on on working with David that you felt like the entire world was going to come crashing down around you? Which we all have those days on set. And how did sure. you over, how did you overcome those days? And it could have been anything from a camera fu- fell in the lake to the actor didn't come out of the the thing, or or the sun's going down. We're losing the light. What is what was that day for you and David? Sure, it was you know the first day we the first day of shooting on Mank we. Um, we had we had had a plan. We were sort of like we we had um, we had had a plan that 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 MGM and Paramount would have two different looks. That Paramount would be the sort of soft lit, very like gray environment, and it was because it was sort of the low rent at the time. And MGM would be glamorous and hard lit and lots of contrast, and and that's how we would you know. And that was a conversation we had had a lot in the beginning of the movie, you know, like in the prep we had talked about it and talked. And then we you know implemented a bunch of lighting plans as a result. And and the first scene we shot in Mank is the scene where where uh, Gary Oldman is is gambling with his buddies in the writers room, and they're spinning the they're spinning the uh, the coin. And there's a whole, there's a whole kind of bit with them. And they've got a, they've got a showgirl who's, 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 uh, they have a, they have a, a secretary who's dressed as a showgirl. And it's just sort of like, it's, it, there's, you know, levity in the scene and it's sort of silly, you know, and we were going to do it softly. And we were just going to tent the windows and blow them out. It's going to be soft side light, and, you know, um, and that's what we did. And we showed up. We rehearsed the scene the day before and it was lit and, you know, we looked at it and then we, we started shooting and, and at lunchtime, David pulled me aside and he says, it's not working. And none of this is working. It's, it's, it's wrong. This is wrong. And, you know, I'm quite a literal person generally and, and immediately internalized it, you know, it's um, me. I, it's something I did. Re- yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and really what it was, was it was a conversation of like, hey, the, we made this decision to do it this way and we can't do it this way. We need to, we need to change, the, change the look. And, you know, of course, yeah, I mean, I started to feel like, oh my God, what have I done? But then it's, you know, it's just, it was a, it was a decision that we had made that, that, um, that was wrong. And he was quite right, actually, you know? Um, and so we, we quickly moved over to the the second scene we shot is this they're playing cards and it's and it was intended to be this kind of very dramatic slashes of of light and there's patterns on everybody's face and it's sort of classic noir kind of style lighting with a lot of smoke and um and it's okay so we'll go we'll we'll pivot we'll go shoot the scene the next day we're going to go back and shoot this differently and and he you know so we finished the first scene he was really happy with uh, finished the second scene he was quite happy with it and then we went back in we started talking about how we could do it differently and and um, you know, we backed it all up and we put hard light out through the, through the windows instead. And we talked, you know, I explained to him what, what, what I thought we could do differently. And then we shot the scene and it worked great, you know, but it's sort of like, it, it was that moment of failure, you know, it's sort of like, Oh my God, what have we done? You know? Um, but in actuality, the conversation was really, it was just, you know, between two people trying to figure out what, what could be improved, you know, and that's, that's one of the great things about David is, is he, he's very open like that when it's not working. Right. And it's so funny because I'm th- I'm sure there's other cinematographers listening right now going, if I would have shot a scene with David Fincher and then went to lunch and he came up to me at lunch, I'm like, hey, man, yeah, uh, first half day didn't work at all. I can only imagine <laughs> the internal, oh, my, because I, I I mean, I've been around DPs all my, my career. I know how they think. They're like, holy crap, I've, I've screwed this film up. And that's at, let's say, my level. Can you imagine if David Fincher walks up, or Michael Mann walks up, or 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 Joseph sure. Gillespie walks up, some like some these big directors and say something like that? But it automatic isn't it funny how you automatically thought just first it's me, but it was it was a it's not that you like underexpose something that is unusable. No, we exactly executed what we had planned to do, but it is not working stylistically. It's not like there was a, a problem with your technique. Right. It, you what you went after you got. But it's not working. That, but you right. internalized it differently. Right. Yeah, of course. I mean, because it's, you know, it's, I, I think also when you're a cinematographer, you are. I, I think to be to be a working cinematographer, you have to these days. You have to be practical. Right. You know, you have to be responsible and practical and thoughtful, and you have to sort of, you know, the 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 cost of the day on a on a major motion oh. picture is expensive. You know, and it's. Um, 
you want to use your resources wisely and you want to make the right choice, you know, and, um, you know, the idea of reshooting something because, um, because it doesn't look the way the director wants it to look is, is, it, you know, it immediately feels, uh, like failure. Um, you know, I actually, the, I, I quite think that's, it's actually the opposite. I mean, I think that sort of that is the process of developing and creating something with someone is, is learning about what's working, what's not. And in the end, you know, because we sort of looked at it together and we thought it, it, we, we thought about what could be improved. It opened up a lot of things for us on that film and, and, and helped and um and also it, it you know it ultimately made us better collaborators and sort of and it made the it you know it improved the film enormously and so it was like i it just you know it takes fortitude to make that decision in that moment and because there was technically nothing wrong with the scene it just didn't right. look quite right it didn't work um, it just and, didn't you work know, all the camera direction we did is exactly the same you know the performances are quite similar too you know i mean it's like it's not like um like you say, it's not like it was under, you know, mistaken, you know, seemingly underexposed three stops or something. <laughs> exactly. Now, I, I got to ask you, man, because you're working on some pretty big budgets right now. I mean, the movie you're doing uh, with David, the killer, uh, I'm sure not an independent film. Uh, and and the one you're working with with Michael Mann, um, Ferrari, which obviously I have to go see. Uh, uh, it's my, my grandfather's company, but um, the, uh, the, you know, you're talking about massive budgets. It, the pressure is heavy on a normal cinematographer on a basic budget. There's a lot of people asking you things on a director as well, but uh, you know, your, your department, what's it like dealing with not just five people? You, I'm assuming your crew is fairly massive. And you've got a lot of things going on and then you've got responsibilities here and there. And then like you were saying, costs and, and make it, it, it almost seems like the pressure of all the crap that you have to deal with overpowers the creative pressure almost. So there's a balance that you have to, to do. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, you're right. It's, it's, I, I mean, I think that's really where the importance of prep comes in and, um, you know, it's, I, I believe you make the movie in the prep and, and, you know, it's, if you're, if you do it right, you're, um, you know, you're, you're coloring the lines when you're shooting. Um, and it doesn't mean that there isn't room to, to go outside the lines occasionally and make adjustments, but it's, you know, it makes all that stuff easier. If you know where you're going in the prep and you sort of have a, you know, you have a visual plan, you have a, you know, you have a logistical plan about how you're going to move equipment and people and, Know, what your locations are going to be and what your schedule is it's it, it makes all that stuff substantially easier you know it's 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 complicated if you if you haven't done that obviously and then you sort of are are, are you're making the you're making the creative decisions and the aesthetic sort of you know overarching uh artistic stuff at the same time you're trying to solve logistical problems and to me you know that's a real recipe for disaster um so you know if, if you can if you can prep the movie in advance with enough kind of understanding of what's going to happen and, and, you know, with a little bit of contingency for weather or whatever, then it, it alleviates a lot of that stress, but you're right. I mean, um, you know, a lot of the job uh, on a bigger movie like that is, is just personality management and people management. And, you know, you're sort of, you are trying to get people pointed in the right direction. You know, I mean, on a, on a, uh, on the movie I do with Michael, you know, we had really big camera department. We we're usually, you know, shooting three or four cameras at any given time. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, you're not in a position necessarily where you can control every frame, you know, I mean, with David and I, it's like, we kind of set every shot together and we're like, okay, we're going to do this and then we're going to do this. We're going to, you know, we're picking each lens together and going through, okay, this is the camera and this is the camera. And then, you know, um, uh, not every movie is like that, you know, um, sure. uh, and, and sometimes I wish they were, you know, I mean, it, 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 sometimes it can spiral out of you to grasp a little bit you have to, you have to claw it back, but, um, but, uh, you know, there's there's a bit of kind of uh, allowing things to happen. You pay out lead and then you kind of pull it back when you can. You sort of try and figure out who's who's right for which shots. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a process of like anything, you know, any kind of massive creative endeavor like that. Now, I do have to ask, man, is it a was it a dream shooting Mank in black and white? Like how you just don't get that opportunity in cinema today. Like I'm sure you got called by 
tons of your cinematographer friends at the ASC going, so what was it like? <laughs> it's like shooting, <laughs> shooting black and white at that level. Just, I mean, unless you're the Coen brothers that does it once in a blue moon, but that generally studios just won't allow it. So this was not only yeah. black and white, it was black and white in the style of, of the golden age of Hollywood. So what was it like as creatively just living in that, in that world of blacks and grays and whites and all of that? Well, I, you know, I mean, honestly, I was really intimidated. I, I, uh, yeah, I can imagine, <laughs> I, you know, I wanted to make the right choices, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard. It's like, I, you know, I, I was at the time I was particularly conscious of, of the fact that, that, that that black and white could easily become cliche, you know, and, and derivative of something, you know, it just, I, I didn't want it to be like, Oh, they're doing the Venetian blind thing, you know, um, <laughs> right. or, they're painting or the shadows on the wall, you know? they're painting the shadows on the wall. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, so it's like, I think, you know, I, I was sort of, you have the idea about what you're going to go out and make, and then you're confronted with the, um, you know, the, the realities of the, of the, the limitations, the locations present to you or the stage sets present to you. And, and you sort of, you know, it's like filmmaking is compromised, you know, so you're always cover, you know, you're always sort of coming to a, coming to an intersection, figuring out, okay, A or B, I'll do this or I'll do this. And you sort of hope that, that the decisions that you make um, in the broad sense congeal enough to make something that's consistent, you know, it's because it's really hard to see the movie, you know, on day six. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I, I think, you know, if I've learned anything from David, it's like, um, and, and Michael actually, and, and a lot of the great directors I've worked from, it's like, you have an idea and stick with it, you know, um, <laughs> don't get cold feet. Don't get, you know, and I did, you know, there were moments on Mank where I was worried and I said, oh, man, I don't know, are we being bold enough? Are we being, um, you know, and I, I went out and had a beer with David one night and I said, I don't know, man, I, I, I worry we're not being bold enough and worry people are going to be critical of it. And he was like, fuck them. No, you're doing exactly what you should do. Just keep, just hold, the, you know, hold the course. Um, and it was, you know, at the time it was exactly what I needed to hear because I was getting insecure about what we were doing and I wasn't sure exactly if it was right. You know? and, uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, in terms of black and white, it was, I mean, God, what incredible opportunity, you know, to do something that, that very few people get to do and, and something I really was excited to do and something I, I quite honestly was not comfortable doing when we, you know, when we started that film. I mean, I got more comfortable with it and I, you know, did a ton of research and I looked at a lot of images and lots of tests and sort of figured out what it was we wanted to do. But we also, we, you know, we wanted to make our own look too and sort of our own style. And, um, that was scary, you know. And yeah, it was. Especially I, considering in the subject matter you know it's like i you know i just felt i felt the weight of, of honoring greg Tolan and and orson wells in the film and the film community as a whole you know when we were making the movie i really you know i wanted to i wanted to be respectful to what you know the kind of the importance of that movie as well you know i mean eric i'm stressed out as you're talking about it, and i didn't shoot the damn thing uh, <laughs> <laughs> i mean as you're talking i'm like oh my god it was really right, fun orson, too er, er, oh, fuck, orson wells and it's citizen kane and and every filmmaker in the world is going to see this because everyone's seen Citizen Kane. And I could imagine you could just drive yourself mad <laughs> thinking about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, easily. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You when, know, or you could just go to work and have a good time and, you know. <laughs> and it's another movie. And you have to th you have to look at it like it's another yeah. movie. If not, you, you'll you you'll psych yourself out without question. Now, I do, uh, you know, you, you are working with Michael Mann, uh, or I'm not sure if you're, I think you're in post-production at this point on that film, if I'm not mistaken. We just what, finished. Yeah, we just yeah, finished. Yeah. So what, I mean, Michael Mann, he's a, he's a legend, man. I mean, he's a legend in our, in, in the, in our business and, you know, as well, legendary stories. You know, I was in Miami when Miami Vice was going on. So, and I came up in Miami. Uh -huh. So all I hear is about Michael Mann, Miami Vice stories from all the old crew guys that I used to work with on the commercials. So he's like, yeah, I was on there when Michael and Eddie almost came on it. Like you hear these stories about what happened back then. So what's it like collaborating with someone like Michael? Cause this is your first collaboration with him, correct? Yeah, yeah it was. I mean, you know, I don't really want to talk a lot about the movie because we sure. just finished it and it's Fair like, enough. we just, 
we just made the sausage and now we're going to age it a little bit and in a little while someone's going to cook it up and then you guys are going to taste it and you have to let us know if we did any good you know but fair um, enough i um you know look it's like i the great thing about this job is coming in and and, and watching other people you know learning how other people make their movies and you know as a cinematographer i think it's your you know it's your job to come in and and uh you know kind of like i said earlier like you figure out how it is you can help you know what is it this person needs from me mm -hmm. um and it's often very different you know it's 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 often you know doesn't um and so there's you know there's a process of discovery i think creatively with people and, and also just just straight up logistically about um, where, where, where does my cog fit within this machine? Um, you know, and the, and the thing about Michael is that he is probably the most tenacious person I know. I mean, he oh. <laughs> will fight forever for his film and he will fight for his actors and he'll fight for the, the but, but, you know, but most importantly, he fights for the story and he fights for what he thinks is important for the scene and nothing else matters. And I really admire that about him. You know, I mean, he uh, he is not distracted by the kind of incidental stuff that that, um, you know, me and my fellow cinematographers would go crazy about if it if it detracts from something that is dramatically important to him. And and I think, by the way, that he's he's absolutely right about that. And it's something I really learned from him is. Um, you know, you protect the film and the story first and, and, and all the other things are, are secondary. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's an interesting environment to, to participate in and, and, you know, the kind of energy that that feeds is, is exciting and, and sometimes complex and, um, and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, frenetic, but, um, <laughs> but you know, um, but Michael, you know, he's a he's a force, and uh, and and he's he's incredible, you know. And it's and the thing is, you know, I I have been fortunate to work with a few directors uh, of his vintage, and um, mm -hmm. and you know, they they there's there's something really special about working with people that have been through, you know, it's, we're not talking ten thousand hours, we're talking a hundred thousand hours, you know. Mm -hmm of uh you know understanding cinema language understanding blocking thinking about the scene thinking about and then doing it their way you know and they're not distracted about like well this is how you're supposed you know you need an over the shoulder and then you need a two shot and you should get the pov and you know um michael doesn't work that way it's not you know he's he's um he's working um uh in 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 his language exclusively and and that's that's really cool you know um because a lot of filmmakers, especially younger ones, will turn to you and say, well, what do I need now? You know, how many shots to tell this scene or whatever? And you can have your opinion. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I think uh, it's, you know, as cinematographers, we're, so, we're there to provide guidance and assistance and, 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 and interpret things visually and contribute. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I, I think... Of all the directors that I admire, the, the ones um, who speak through the frame are, are are my favorites. You know, the directors that really kind of um, are are you know uh, you know uh, approach it holistically are, are the ones that I respond to the best. And so so I'm I'm really cautious when I when I inject too much of my personal opinion um, uh, in, into a director's workflow if they haven't asked for it. You know. If I may piggyback on your sausage uh, analogy, uh, the it's kind of like a great chef who has made the sausage a thousand times the way that it's in the textbook, and now they're just they're just kind of riffing. It's kind of doing like kind of jazz in a sense. And like, well, but you really need to put the meat in the casing first. It's like, no, I'm going to put the casing in the middle. I'm going to wrap the sausage or the meat around it. And then I'm going to bread it. And then I'm going to deep fry. It. And then there's other, you're just approaching it at different ways. And everyone's like, oh, wow. But he understands the basics of how to make or how to shoot a scene exactly how it's textbook supposed to be done. But because he has so much understanding of the medium of the language, just like David, they could just riff and do whatever. They, you don't need a two shot. 
You don't need a one. She can cut the whole damn thing on a long shot on a hundred mil through a tree and it works. <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, right. oh. but on the, in the textbooks, any film school teacher would go, don't do that. But they just understand right. that language. It's like a Tarantino. Like they understand the film language so well that they just, they riff. It's jazz. It's like watching jazz play. And you are one of the collaborators in the band working with a master jazz player. It's kind of like, you know, if I may use jazz as analogy, you're there and you're just like watching, just going, I handed him the trumpet, but holy cow, I didn't know he was going to do that with it. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like, yeah, you know, it's, I mean, if you're going to you know, run with you allow me to run with that analogy a little bit, it's like, if, you know, if we're playing jazz, then, then, um, then in that, you know, in those situations, I'm really just trying to make sure everybody's in tune. Oh, great. And you oh know? yeah. Yeah. I just want to make sure that we're just trying to like, you know, it's like, okay, I get it. Now we're going to go, Oh, we're going to D. All right, cool. Let's play D. All right. Let's, well, you're a little sharp, you know, like, let's just like, just sort of attenuate it a little bit enough. Um, you, you know, I, and you know, it's, it, that's, that's a wonderful thing about this job is, is watching how people make movies and learning how there are different types of movies, you know, different ways to make movies, um, you know, and also learning about the kinds of movies that you want to make, you know, I mean, it's like every time I finish a film, I, uh, I think about the types of collaborators I'm going to seek out too, you know, and the types of work I'm interested right. in doing, the things I'm less interested in doing. And, you know, I am definitely someone, um, you know, I, I, I quite like the kind of surgical type of filmmaking. I like puzzle pieces of figuring out how to, you know, the, the, you know, like I, I, you know, Hitchcock is like my favorite filmmaker, you know, this sort of like the puzzle of, of, you know, show the person seeing something and show the audience what they see, you know, even that, you know, it's a vast simplification of, of, of it, but, um, uh, you know, thinking about how to break a scene down into his bare bones and, 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 and tell the story that way is, is, um, is the type of filmmaking at the moment anyway, that I'm interested in. Um, but you, some, you know, it's like, no, you got some good collaborators yeah. to do that kind of, I mean, David for, for, I mean, as you talk about puzzle piece directors, he is, he's definitely that guy and Michael exactly the same. I mean, but David specifically, like he is, he, I, look, I mean, and not to blow smoke up David's ass, but he is our Hitchcock. He is our Kubrick. There'll never be anyone like Kubrick or Hitchcock, but in our generation, there's very few filmmakers who are as surgical as, as him. And then Michael has his, there's never going to be another Michael Mann and people will be studying Michael Mann yeah. movies for, in, in, in film schools a hundred years from now. And same thing with David, you know, and, and same thing with Tarantino and Nolan and, and some of these other greats there, there's a handful that are our generations, Hitchcocks and our generations, Kubrick's that you just, you sit back and you get you're lucky enough to get to work with the, with some of these guys, man. I mean, you you must smile every day going to work. I'd imagine most days. <laughs> <laughs> most mostly, I'm worried about whether or not that condor got parked in the right place. <laughs> you know, is the funny. techno crane here? Why is it the techno <laughs> yeah, crane exactly. here? God damn yeah, it! Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's, so is, I mean, if you, you know, it's like, <laughs> go ahead. No, no, if there's, look, if you had a chance to go back um, and tell your younger self who's just starting off in the business one thing, what would that thing be? Um, it has nothing to do with the equipment. Oh, great. Don't spend Thank so you. Much time worrying about it. Thank you. Yeah. you. You mean to tell me I don't need the latest, I don't need to shoot 24K or 48K? No. no. <laughs> No, and by the way, need, you're, and, you know, and you're you coming from the newest. and no, but the thing is that you're coming from the perspective of one of the most technical directors of and working with David, who is, I mean, he's always on the the cutting edge with Reds and 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 what you guys did with Mank and and even then you're saying, it's it's not always about the latest camera, the latest lens, or the latest lights. No, no. No, I mean some some of the best shots we did in Mank were lit with a sixty watt light bulb. You know, I mean it's it's. Right. I mean, it, you know, it's uh, sure. I mean, technology helps you. You know, mm -hmm. technology makes things easier, 
uh, but it doesn't give you better taste and it doesn't, it, it doesn't give you better ideas, you know? Um, and, and when I was younger, if I had spent more time thinking about the ideas and less time thinking about the equipment, I would have had better ideas, you know? <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, and I got, you know, you, because you get seduced, you know, you get seduced in film school oh. by, you know, you read American Photographer Magazine and ICG Magazine and they're all the advertisements and everyone's trying to sell you this and that. And, um, and you start to think, oh man, if I shoot 35 millimeter on my film, my film will be better. Or, you know, if I, if I get an 18 K, then I'll be able, you know, and it's, yeah, you know, it's funny. It's like the longer I spend this business, you know, and, and the more I have to kind of repent for, um, <laughs> The, the 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 requests I make to producers, um, the more I remind them that that the things I need are generally schedule driven. They're not aesthetic, you know. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for example, if 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 I you know if I can shoot the establishing shot at at nine a.m. when it's backlit and it's beautiful and there's you know mist in the air and stuff, I don't need anything. I just need the camera. But if this, the actor isn't available till three p.m., then I need all this stuff you know mm -hmm. um yeah. and and that's that's unfortunately the problem of the big movie you know the small movie is nimble enough to make that choice yeah great you need to shoot at 9 a.m let's shoot at 9 a.m um you know let's figure that out uh you know on on a on a big marvel production or a, or a, or a, you know uh a big war movie like devotion you know where you're sort of uh, you're, you're balancing, you know, you're balancing aircraft and, you know, when, when, when the, when the ceiling is lifted, so the, the planes can take on and off, you can't necessarily shoot it at 6am when the light is perfect, you have to shoot at 11 or whatever, you know, so you have to figure out how, to, with, you know, and the compromises become about seeing the big picture and not being myopic around um, what is, what is immediately important to the image versus what's important to the movie, you know, and, and that's kind of, I think, ultimately the biggest lesson for me has been like learning to recognize how my needs impact the rest of the film and how to best navigate it and sort of advocate for what I think is important without detracting from what's important for the film as a whole, you know? And, and I think a lot of younger cinematographers fall in this trap of like, no, 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 it has, I have to shoot anamorphic and I have to, blah, 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 you know, <laughs> and then, you know, they spend $4,000 a week on lenses and then there's no money for costumes. You know what I mean? And it's like, <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's important to be thoughtful, I think, about how, how you, how you absorb the resources of a movie as a cinematographer and how you, um, how you advocate for the things you need. Now you, you brought up Devotion, which is your new movie, which another small independent film you've been doing. Um, can you, can you tell everybody a little bit about the movie? And I mean, it looks gorgeous, man. I saw the trailer for it. It absolutely looks stunning. Uh, again, you're getting you. to play with some beautiful toys in a vintage piece. Uh, I mean, you you can really get to have some fun, man. You're having some fun with some nice toys. I know, I know you. I know you had to suffer in Italy with Michael Mann on on the latest film. Uh, I'm <laughs> sure. I'm sure the food was horrible. The weather was bad. I mean, you're you're you're, you're living a tough life, sir. But uh, <laughs> but, de <laughs> but devotion. Tell me about devotion. Devotion. You know. Um... I got a, I got a phone call from a from a, from a, a friend of mine, Bruce Franklin, who was who had been a, a, a first AD that I had worked with a lot with Joe Kaczynski and mm -hmm. and um, you know old friend of mine, and he called me up one day. I was in Chicago doing the finale of Fargo, the TV show Fargo, and my phone rang, and he said, "Hey, I got this script you should read. I'm producing." And I said, "I didn't know that he had he had started producing." And I said, "Okay, cool, Bruce. Yeah, send it over." And he sent me the script and I read it. And I was like, oh my God, this is so great. You know, it was, it was, it's a war film, but it, it was really a drama in, in the, uh, under, under the, um, the guise of a war film. Um, and, uh, and it was period. And he's, he, you know, he said, look, I've got airplanes. We're going to shoot it for real. We're not going to do a bunch of visual effects. We're going to we have an aerial unit. They're going to go up and they're going to put these planes in the air. We're going to choreograph this. And I think you're the guy oh. to do it. I want you to meet with the director. And I said, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, get me on the phone. So we met, I met JD Diller the next day and we had a, you know, I don't know, two and a half hour meeting and we just talked about everything. We talked about the movie, 
we also talked about life and we talked about cinema and we talked about history and race and politics and, you know, a lot of things that related to the movie and a lot of things that didn't just because we became fast friends. And, um, and I, you know, I, I finished the zoom call and my phone rang and, and it was Bruce and he said, Hey, do you want the job? <laughs> I said, yeah, of course I want the job. So we did it. Um, and it was great because I had, you know, they, they had, um, they knew that they had, they had bitten off a, a, a big chunk and, and they wanted to do it right. The producers, um, really, you know, wanted to support the film and they were prepared to sort of support the film. So I had a lot of prep time and I sat with JD and we, you know, we, we sat in LA and we storyboarded and, you know, brainstormed ideas about how we could approach it and what worked and what didn't. We talked to people, you know, the guys that had done Dunkirk and, um, the guys that had done Midway and we, you know, we sort of just did our research and we looked at stuff we liked and stuff we didn't like. And, and, um, and then, you know, when Thomas production designer joined the movie and then the three of us would sit down and talk about different ways to call, you know, how much of the aircraft carrier to build and, you know, how are we going to shoot the buck stuff and what can we do for real? And, you know, then Kevin LaRosa and, and Mike Fitzmaurice joined the party and they were, um, there are our, our aerial unit, Mike Fitzmaurice, aerial DP, and, and Kevin, the aerial coordinator, and a second unit director, um, aerial director anyway, um, got involved. And, and that was like a whole new world opened up to me. And I, you know, I had, I had shot some aerials, but mostly like helicopter establishing shots, very simple things, you know, and, and they had a whole different set of tools available to them that they started to explain to us what, what they could do. And we started, you know, hold little model planes up in the air and storyboard and shoot, you know, kind of um, lo-fi previs videos and talk about how those sequences were gonna, gonna work together. And, you know, it was great. We had it was an incredible experience making that movie. It was, you know, it was a lot of people that really, really cared about it and, and wanted to support JD and the project and were excited. And, and, and we had producers that were, um, just incredibly supportive of, through the whole process and really wanted us to succeed and were willing to to listen to uh, an outlook that, that maybe otherwise would have been expensive. You know, there was certainly plenty of visual effects solutions to our problems that, that would have saved them a lot of money, but I think would have um, would have been detrimental to the film. And, and, and uh, you know, that fortunately for us, they agreed and, and they were willing to go down the road with us and try to figure out ways to do a lot of it for real. And that, you know, that I think in the end paid, paid dividends. So, you know, I'm really thankful to them that they, they um, were, were uh, forward thinking in that way. You know, I guess maybe it's backward thinking because that's how it would have been done 75 years ago. <laughs> so, so they pulled like a Top Gun Maverick. They was like, no, no, we're going to put the, we're going to put the planes in the air and we're going to shoot this. Um, do you see a, a movement because you're working in the big in the studio projects like that? Do you see a movement or almost a slight backlash against so much visual effects, so heavy visual effects? And they're like, no, let's get it for real. Because I mean, even Nolan on on Dark Knight, when he flipped that 18 wheeler, he did it for real, you know, and you can tell and you can sense it. There's something organic on screen that when you're able to do things real, it you I mean, that, I, I think that's one of the main reasons Top Gun Maverick was such a massive hit, among other reasons, but just something we just haven't seen before. You don't see that in today's world. So I'm assuming that, yeah. you know, what you what you guys did in Devotion is going to be, you know, similar in the sense that you did it. But do you feel that as a cinematographer, that, there, that there's a, a movement towards like, let's get to see if we could do this for real back back the way it was done even 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, so like Richard Donner did it, you know, I mean, I think it's, <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, I, mean, I, yeah, I, I, look, the audience knows we can do anything, you know, I mean, the audience has seen guardians of the galaxy, you know, no disrespect <laughs> to guardians of the galaxy, but they no. know that, you know, they know we can take them to space. We know we can put you on an alien planet. We know we can, you know, fly to the center of the earth. So it's, it's not, you know, that it's, it, it used to be the David Copperfield event magic show. You know, that's what the, the audience would go to the theater for, right? They go for the, the spectacle. And now I think the audience goes for the card, the, the sleight of hand card trick. You know, they want to, they want to feel it. They, 
they would prefer to they would prefer to not even notice that it's happening instead of seeing this kind of all the razzle dazzle on screen. Um, that's my opinion anyway. But so I I think I think when you can do it for real and you can do it for real with with the assistance of visual effects, maybe you know you clean right. up the you clean up the stick that's holding the camera on the plane. <laughs> Um, right, things like that, right. It's different than making a plane, you know what I mean? Um, and it looks different and it and it feels it feels different. And and I also think in some ways it forces filmmakers that that mode of thinking and and, and look, there's there's plenty of visual effects and devotion, but but we set some rules for ourselves and say, okay, well, we're gonna put the camera, we're only we're only gonna put the camera in places where we could put a camera on a real aircraft. So we're not going to, you know, we're not going to put the cat, the plane in front of a blue screen and fly around, fly the camera around it on a, on a techno crane and give you all these crazy shots and go, you know, go through the landing gear and up over the flaps. And, up, you know, we're not going to do that stuff. We're going to do, um, we're going to do things that you could really do mm -hmm. basically um, that, you know, that apply to physics to some degree. And, um, and I think you're going to see more more of that. And I think actually, you know, Tom Cruise deserves a tremendous amount of credit for for as as someone who is is yes. promoting the idea and saying, hey, look, you know, cinema is important and it's worth protecting and it's a national treasure and we have to, um, and we have to, you know, the it, the audience deserves something better than than um, than you know, previsiting the the virtual camera through a, uh, you know through the wormhole or whatever, you know, I mean, it's, there's, there's, it has to be story forward and thoughtful and considerate and, and respectful to the audience, you know? And, and again, there is, I mean, Pandora is not going to be shot practically, you know, uh, that's not a practical, you can't go to fly to Pandora and shoot those things practically. So there is a place for that kind of storytelling. You know, when you go into the quantum realm, Ant-Man, probably not going to build a set or a miniature for that. It's going to, right. <laughs> But if it's right. something that can be yeah, done, exactly. if it's something that can be done, it should try to be done, especially at that budget level. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, you know, I think also, you know, with, with all due respect to to um, other filmmakers, it's it when you do it, if you do it digitally, you can make it up later. If you do it for real, you have to decide in advance. And that's intimidating to some people. You know, you have practical considerations you have to think about. You know, if you're if you're Dick Donner and you're gonna, you know, you're gonna drop the drop the gasoline truck, at, uh, you know, for real with a real pyrotechnic explosion, right. you have to be considerate of how big the explosion is going to be and how far the camera is yeah. going to be and what the, yeah. you know, what the location considerations are. And you have to plan it and you have to go and tech scout and you have to say, okay, we're going to put the camera here and put the camera here and put the camera here and the, and we're going to suspend it from a truck and we're going to drop it and it's going to explode and there's going to be four days of cleanup and we're going to pay off all the local businesses. And it's, you know, like that, it requires advanced thought in the way that doing a, the gasoline truck, you know, shooting a plate doesn't, right? But there's obvious significant advantages to doing it for real. It's just more difficult and it requires, you know, sort of consider it requires directing to some degree, you know. Can I um so I, you know, I support that idea. I just I just wish more people did it. And I wish and I and it's part of why I like working with older directors because they understand that and they um they advocate for it. You know what I mean? They don't go for the easy solution because it helps the location department. They don't have to pay off that business or whatever. You know what I mean? No, no, no. we're going to drop the truck for real and we're going to blow it up. <laughs> you know, can I, I have to tell, can I tell you a story really quickly? Cause it's, it, this is a, going to exactly what we're talking about. I had Simon West on the show who was a legendary mm -hmm. action director. And he was telling me how he did the Con Air uh, gag when the plane crashed into Vegas and they found a hotel mm -hmm that was going to be demolished and like, hold on, can we run a plane into the front for our movie? And they said, yes. And there was, it shut down Vegas for a minute. But the thing was, and this is goes to your point of like, you have to plan ahead. He had six cameras on that, on that shot. It was a one take. You had, there was one take. Someone said something over the, over the, <laughs> the walkies. The cameras start. They just took off, but none of the cameras were rolling. First AD was like, "Oh uh -huh. crap! Oh crap!" 
to, to turn it on, turn it on. So I'm like, to, to turn it on, we're going, we're going. And everyone's like freaking out. And then he's like, I had six, but then two, four of them didn't work. So I had two. And then we're like, okay. And like, he told the whole story is like three, when three didn't make it, this is all film, by the way. And then the two made it. And then at the end, we only really, one was out of focus because it's the first AD. Oh, that's right. The crews couldn't, the, the crews were eating at, <laughs> at Crafty and they just, everything was going. So the cameras were going and they had to run to turn them on. Wow. Oh my. So at the end, they had one shot, one take on one angle. And that's the angle they got. <laughs> He's like, what you, I can't go back and shoot it again. This is why you had six. Right. If I would have had five, we would have been in trouble. <laughs> but that's a different way of well, thinking you know, about it. It is. It is. It is. You know, I, I, I and I think, I think it's, you know, sin, if filmmaking has been made, it's, it's easier now. You know, it's a lot easier. I mean, you know, when I was growing up and I was, just, you know, I, I came out of film school with one film, you know, and it was like, I had, you know, it was, it had been transferred to beta SP and I had a VHS tape and I would go and show it to people and hand them the VHS tape and look at my movie as NTSC, you know, had the letterbox oh, on it. Great quality. You know? Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, and if I wanted to make more copies, I had to go find a place that had, the, had an SP deck because I couldn't dupe the VHS, you know, and it was just like long before DVD. And, you know, kids come out of film school now and they have like six movies that have all been made, you know, on a red camera or, you know, an Alexa or something. And, um, God, I mean, I would have been, oh. I, I, what a privilege, you know, what a tremendous privilege to have. And, um, you know, so that, that, and I think that extends out outward into cinema. So, you know, so when people are like, oh, I don't have any opportunities, I'm, I'm, I'm not that empathetic, <laughs> you <laughs> Listen, know, I because, <laughs> <laughs> I'll listen. I mean, I, I spent 50 grand on my first demo reel as a commercial director shooting on 35 because you had to shoot 35 yeah. and I would make right. beta SP masters and then I would convert them to three quarter inch. And that's what mm -hmm. I would send out to the agencies because VHS, that's that was for amateurs. So then it was the cost and I had to make the, the big clam cases and I had to FedEx them all over the place. And and it was like and now they're like, oh, yeah, I shot this thing on an iPhone. And I'm like, you sons of a bitch. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, um, no, so, you know, there was no Vimeo when I was, you know, when I was came out of film school. That's there was sure. no internet, sir. Let's just go. There was no internet. Maybe yeah, there was no, there was definitely no video. There was no video, uh, on online, yeah. <laughs> especially when I came out. Yeah. That's true. Uh, uh, not, not good, that's true. not good video, at least. Um, now, no. when does the devotion come out? Uh, uh, November 24th in theaters. November, November 24th. Oh, so right, right. Yeah. No, it's just for the holidays. It's and it seems like an epic. It seems like yeah. a cinematic experience. You got to go see it in the movies. I, I I I hope everyone does. Yeah, we did it. At, there's an IMAX release. If you have an IMAX theater near you, you can see it. Um, that's exciting. This is the first film I've done that's been IMAX. And um, yeah, I think it's you know it's it's certainly a story and a film that deserves to be seen big. It was intended to be seen big. You know, we shot it to be seen big. So, now yeah. I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all my guests. Um, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Everybody's going to tell you no, and that your work isn't any good, and you can't do it, and you got to ignore them. Fair enough. What is the lesson that took yeah. you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? That there's always another job, but um, <laughs> but you have to. Uh, <laughs> there's there's always another job, um, and the time off is is more important than the time at work so you got to prioritize yeah. you have to you have to prioritize your time off with the people that you love that's 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 the thing that's that's most important i think and I've, as i've talked to a lot of dps uh in my day and worked with them they're like dude the the divorce rate is pretty high <laughs> i mean it's not yeah. it's, it's no yeah. joke it's no joke especially when you become successful as a dp the balance is really difficult it's difficult to, to do so that's something they don't tell you when you start walking down this path no they don't but no, that was really don't. i mean look you know I, I i think i spent 28 days in my bed last year you know i mean it's 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 challenging you know you spend a lot of time in hotels a lot of traveling and it's a lot to ask of your loved ones and your family and it's um yeah you know it's it, it they don't you're right they don't teach you that in film school and they should and and i you know when i speak to students or whatever i try to I try to say, listen, you know, um, 
if you, if you want to get in this, make sure that you're ready for that, you know, because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it can be quite, quite challenging for sure. It's the carny life, sir. We are just carnies and putting up tents, <laughs> putting on shows and taking the tent down, getting everything on the exactly. train and, and going to the next location <laughs> and setting up shop again. We're carnies at the end of the day. Um, now, and last question, three of your favorite films of all time. Oh God, how much time do you have? That's a long <laughs> list. Just three, just three of your, <laughs> three of your favorite films that come up in your mind today. Uh, Oh my God. I, I mean, I, you know, God, people ask me that question all the time. I, I think Chinatown's way up there, mm -hmm. you know, um, close encounters. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I should pick a, I should pick a foreign film because it's underrepresented <laughs> in the list. Fair enough. Fair enough. Up to uh, you. Up to you. Uh, and my colleagues will judge me, but I, I'm not going to do that. I mean, I think Raiders, Ugh. Raiders of the Lost Ark probably. I mean, it's just, it's like those, I just think about the movies that I, they're the movies I admire and I respond to creatively. And, and then there are the movies that I, I have seen a hundred times. And, and, and that is one of them. It's, it's like one of those movies that I've just probably, I've probably they, seen it 150 times. You know? And they move, and they move the, 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 the medium forward. All three of those movies moved the medium forward in one way, shape or form. And Steven, yeah, for sure. I, I, and I can't even start talking about Steven. I mean, Jesus, I mean, I've, I've had so many people on the show who've worked with Steven and I just, yeah, I, I'm not going to gush over Stephen, uh, but yeah, uh, but brother man, thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing your uh, sharing your experiences with us, and uh, I can't wait to see you devotion, and I hope everybody goes out in the theater and actually sees it, sits in a theater just like they did uh, Top Gun Maverick, and enjoy the real life spectacle that you kind of put together, brother. So I really appreciate your time, man, and continue doing some great work. I can't wait to see. Uh, Ferrari and the killer that those two, another two films. I mean, again, you're, you're doing okay for yourself right now, sir. <laughs> yeah. Thanks Alex. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying one day at a time, you know, a pleasure, brother. Thanks. Appreciate again. it. Thanks so much. Amen. Cheers.